colleagues, students, and guests, good afternoon. My name is Inga Musselman. I'm acting provost and professor of chemistry here at the University of Texas at Dallas. And today it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2016 Polycarp Cush Lecture Series, Concerns of the Lively Mind. Shortly, I will ask Dean Perkul to come forward to introduce today's lecturer, our esteemed colleague, Dr. Suresh Sethi. But first, I would like to provide you with a little bit of background about Polycarp Cush and the lecture series. You may know that Dr. Polycarp Cush was a member of our physics faculty for 10 years, from 1972 until his retirement in 1982 first as Eugene McDermott Chair and then Regental Professor. He came to the University of Texas at Dallas to help build a new university in a cotton field near Dallas, a university that from the outset was destined to be, quote, not quite like the ones that were in existence at the time, unquote. And this was immensely appealing to Dr. Cush. Prior to his days at UT Dallas, Dr. Cush was on the faculty at Columbia University, where he also took on administrative roles as physics department chair, vice president and dean of the faculty, and then vice president of academic affairs and provost. In 1955, while at Columbia, Dr. Polycarp Cush was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics with colleague Dr. William Lamb for their contributions to the knowledge of the atom. In collaboration with another Columbia physicist, Dr. Dr. Henry Foley, Dr. Cush conducted experiments to precisely determine one of the electron's most important physical properties, the magnetic moment. This work has been instrumental in the development of new technology, including magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. In addition to the Nobel Prize, Cush was awarded eight honorary degrees, and he was elected to the membership in the National Academy of Sciences, among other honors. A longtime educator, Dr. Cush was not only an eminent physicist, but also an award-winning teacher. It was reported that Cush dearly loved his work, especially the teaching, and that he once said, quote, I describe myself as an adequate scientist, but I am a superb teacher." At Columbia, he was chosen to teach an introductory physics course for non-science majors, informally known as Physics for Poets. Columbia awarded him their Great Teacher Award. At UT Dallas, Dr. Cush was known for his lecture demonstration course named The Phenomena of Nature for which he assembled a first-rate collection of equipment to show physicists and non-physicists alike just how nature works. Following Dr. Cush's retirement in 1982 and to honor him, the University of Texas at Dallas established the Polycarp Cush Lecture Series, and each spring since 1985, one of our esteemed faculty colleagues has delivered a lecture with a theme related to concerns of the lively mind. At this time, I would like to recognize the former Cush lecturers who are here today. Would you please stand and be recognized? John Graham. <laughs> Through our annual Cush event, the University of Texas at, Dal at Dallas simultaneously honors former colleague Dr. Polycarp Cush and a current distinguished colleague. We are so honored that our respected colleague, Dr. Suresh Sethi, is this year's Cush lecturer. Dean Perkul, would you please come forward to introduce Professor Sethi? Suresh, I'm truly honored uh, to have this opportunity to introduce you today. Um, our speaker today, Suresh Sethi, is not only a colleague, but also a close friend. We at the School of uh, Jindal School of Management owe him a tremendous debt of gratitude for everything he's done for us. Um, he started his education at India IIT Bombay 
He was a mechanical engineering student there, so undergrad degree in mechanical engineering. Came to the United States, got his MBA at uh, university, uh, actually Washington State University, and went on to Carnegie Mellon to receive his PhD in 1972. So, uh, quick math, 44 years in academia. Um, so, uh, he has a brief stint at Rice as an assistant professor, and then he moved on to University of Toronto at uh, 73, and spent the next 24 years at the University of Toronto. And uh, we were fortunate to convince him to come and join us at 97. So uh, I joined at 96. Mm -hmm. So he literally was one of the members of the first class of faculty I hired, mm -hmm. and um, uh, or was hired when I was the dean. And uh, we were. Uh, uh, it is no accident that that first class. Uh, contained uh, people in information systems and operations because that was my field and uh, and I could do more to convince them that we were going to create a great school and uh, and uh, and in fact he went on and become the leader and build uh, one of the top three operations departments in the nation no matter how you measure it okay. So great accomplishment. Um, he has published and publishing as we speak. So whatever number I give you, add 15 on publication <laughs> by next year. Okay, and, and, and it is amazing that he still has the drive and and he truly loves uh, researching and writing. So he has been an accomplished. Uh, uh, a very prolific author. He has uh, written 10 books and, and edited monograms. Uh, over 400 journal papers. Uh, now, to put things in perspective, uh, depending on the discipline, 400 papers might not be a lot. In our discipline, 400 papers is absolutely amazing. A career, if you have written uh, 70, 80 papers in a career this long, you have done a great job. You have written 400 papers. I don't know, you must be writing papers during lunch and, and, and dinner as well. Uh, and, and, and as I said, he's not done yet. I know by next year he's going to have 10 or 15 more. That's his annual production rate. <laughs> so uh, he has. Uh, he has had many postdocs, most of them when he was in Toronto. Some of those folks have gone on and become chair professors and very distinguished uh, faculty. Uh, he has had 22 PhD students. Uh, interestingly enough, 18 of them at UTD. <laughs> so uh, he has contributed tremendously. And, uh, and his students, again, went on and become very successful uh, academics in their own right. Um, many awards, uh, recognitions, accolades. I'm just going to briefly go over them. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Uh, he is a fellow of New York Academy of Sciences, fellow of IEEE, fellow of INFORMS, which is our society, fellow of American Association for Advancement of Science, uh, fellow of POMS, it's another society that we belong to, uh, fellow of uh, SIAM, and, uh, and uh, he served uh, most recently as the president of POMS. And, uh, and most recently, he actually was recognized um, by Carnegie Mellon as a Distinguished Alumni Achievement Award, 19, 2000, 2015, just last year. So uh, I can go on and, and, and talk about Suresh's accomplishments, but as I have said, 
has uh, t for us uh, the, the accomplishment that touches us is what he has built here. This is a man that truly uh, is an institution builder. I have seen many senior faculty members um, who have hired many outstanding faculty members. They tend to be in their field or close to their research area. Suresh, on the other hand, has hired great faculty members that are not in his field, that have nothing to do with what he does. Okay, to me, that's truly a sign of intellectual, I don't, I don't know how to define it, but this is a true sign of a great intellectual. He has respect for research, it, regardless of the research, the paradigm the research takes place in. And he respects people that have accomplished in their own discipline and in their own fields, using their own tools. And, uh, and that made it possible for us to put together a world-class operations uh, department that is truly wide uh, in terms of the interest of the faculty and, and their uh, publication outlets, uh, and made it possible for us to be a world-class operations department. So, we owe you one, Suresh, <laughs> and uh, we can never repay you, and the university can never repay you. I'm glad that uh, we're going to get to listen to what you do for fun. So <laughs> without any further ado, please come and join. Thank you uh, for that very kind introduction, Hassan. Um, I'll tell you one secret why I wrote so many papers, since you mentioned that to me. Um, one night, I was dreaming about a problem. Um, and I had some idea. And I thought I'll forget it by the time I wake up. So I, without switching on the lights, I wrote some notes next room in my house. When I woke up in the morning, I did write a paper, and that, that paper eventually got published in Science. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I gave you one, one, one paper um, that I did that way, but I don't know. <laughs> so, so welcome, and welcome you all. Um, I thank you all for coming to the 2016 Polycarpus Lecture. I don't know whether that is 2015 or 2016. Um, for which I'm honored and extremely humbled. I'm very excited today to share with you some aspects of my research uh, in supply chain management. While I've done work in many areas, such as optimal control, dynamic models in advertising, consumption investment decisions subject to bankruptcy, scheduling in robotic cells, and inventory problems with incomplete information. I chose today's topic in part because I thought it could be delivered without resorting to complicated math or even a single equation. And it also happens to be a main focus of my career research. Incidentally, when I mentioned to a Finnish colleague that I was planning to do the whole lecture without a single equation, her sharp response was, that would be very tough for you. <laughs> so, a lot of people have contributed to my research. I'm thankful to all my students, uh, uh, colleagues, and assistants who have worked with me over the years. Some of them are here today, and so I would like to acknowledge them. These include Alain Bessoussan, uh, Melinda Vande, Anyan Chi, uh, Metin Chakanali Durham, uh, Melinda Vande. Uh, my students, Shao Kwan Chen, Ting Ro, uh, Shishan, and Subhat Kumar, who is uh, all the way coming here from Khali Station. Um, and had a problem finding parking here. 
I am thankful to Hassan for recruiting me uh, and giving me the opportunity to build a world-class group of researchers in operations management, which we now have here in the Tyndall School. I'm also thankful to UTD for this recognition of my research. And last but not least, I'm grateful to my wife, Andrea, and daughter Chantal Anjali for their loving support over the years. They were still working on my text yesterday night. <laughs> Let's now come to the main topic of the lecture, the conflicts in supply chain and contracts that restore efficiency. Since all of us consume goods produced by supply chains, the first question we should ask is, what is a supply chain? The poster designed, notice the word chains in my title, and voila, we have a chain on the poster. <laughs> but my topic has nothing to do with physical chains. Although the links in this chain could represent the linked entities in supply chain, indeed, there's much information about supply chain available on the internet, so I would like to show you a short YouTube clip from the Academy of International Modern Studies. What is a supply chain? A supply chain is a global network used to deliver products and services from raw materials to end customers through an engineered flow of information, physical distribution and cash. This figure illustrates a very basic supply chain with three entities. A producer with one supplier and one customer. Four basic flows connect the supply chain entities together. The flow of physical materials and services from suppliers through the intermediate entities that transform them into consumable items for distribution to the final customer. The flow of cash from the customer back upstream toward the raw material supplier. The flow of information back and forth along the chain. And the reverse flow of products returned for repairs, recycling or disposal. A simplified chain in this figure might be made up of these organizations. A supplier, a provider of goods or services, or a seller with whom the buyer does business, as opposed to a vendor, which is a generic term referring to all sellers. A producer that receives services, materials, supplies, energy. A customer that receives shipments of finished products to deliver to its customers. This video clip gives you a general idea of what supply chains are. And the screenshot depicts a supply chain involving a bakery, with which you are all familiar. Uh, it includes a bunch of suppliers, uh, a bakery with, oops, oh. a bakery. Um, which with your familiar, it includes a bunch of suppliers, a bakery with both production and retail operations, and finally consumer who are all of us. Our focus today is on a very simple supply chain. In this supply chain, the retailer buys goods from the supplier in order to sell in the market. Uh, they both make independent decisions uh, regarding prices and quantities, uh, their independent decisions are not often in the best interest of this, the supply chain as a whole. So we need to design contracts that enable these parties uh, to coordinate in some way so that they make decisions which are in the best interest of the total supply chain. I will become more and more specific as I go along and eventually drill down to a simple example that we can uh, follow. Uh, by the way, this logo hangs up in the third floor kitchen of our our, our uh, departmental kitchen, and it says, I love supply chain management. So. <laughs> so here now we have a supplier uh, who sets a wholesale price, 
and a retailer, after so the supply sells the wholesale price, will respond to decide on the order quantity. Uh, the supplier, the, 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 their self free actions, they, 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 they each maximize their own profit. And that, that, that their self-serving actions do not actually maximize the profit of the entire supply chain. And so this resulting efficiency is due to what is called double marginalization. The double marginalization, the supplier puts up a margin over his cost, and that gives him his profit. Uh, and the retailer earns a margin, which is, which is equal to the difference between the retail price and, and the wholesale price that he pays. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, the margin word appears twice in the explanation. So, <laughs> so, so we just we just defined that the, that there is a double marginalization, which is that which is the loss of uh, profit when you compare to what the best the supply chain can do. We need to create a benchmark in order to assess the loss of efficiency. Uh, Okay. In order to assess the efficiency, we would, we would pose a question, what would be the maximum profit the supplier and retailer can make if they were one company? So like, as you can see, they were one company. In that case, they will only produce a quantity. The wholesale price is the internal transaction is that what comes into the picture. And they will just decide on the quantity to produce, which is best for them. And it turns out that this uh, creates a higher profit than if they were making decisions independently. And typically, they also produce a higher quantity. And, and, and this is because the, in the decentralized solution, the retailer uh, is facing uncertain demand. And when he orders too much, he will get stuck with books that he cannot sell. Okay? So, so that's why the retailer independently will order a lesser quantity than if the supply chain were one company. And, the idea then is, are there possible contracts that would allow these two guys to make decisions independently, but behave in such a way that the total supply chain profit is maximized? And there are a number of such contracts. One such contract is a buyback contract that basically, basically, allows, that basically allows the retailer to bring, give, return, the back, return the unsold books back to the supplier at an agreed upon price. And, and of course, higher the, back, higher the buyback price, the higher the quantity will be ordered. So it turns out that there is one, or there is a number of, number of wholesale price and buyback price payers that actually supplier can design that will actually allow the retailer to order just the quantity which is good for the total supply chain. Okay. And so, so we will now illustrate this, 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 this concept that I mentioned. Uh, by a very simple example. So in this simple example, we will consider a case of UTD bookstore. The UTD bookstore will order a number of textbooks from a publisher called Springer. The UTD bookstore will set a wholesale price on that book, and the bookstore will then order a certain quantity depending on the parameters of the problem and the demand it faces. Uh, we have the following data for ease of illustration. Please don't, th th these were designed so that I can put this in a short uh, time frame. So we have here a production cost of the book is $99. So, so this, this obviously includes the royalties that, that the screen has to give to the authors and whatever. So this is the, the cost of the production of the book. The retail, the book sells for a price of $135. And the salvage value, if the book is not sold, is $78. Uh, the bookstore knows that enrollment, of course, will be between 10 and 15. And the random nation demand comes from the fact that the, the enrollment be uncertain, and the students may buy, may buy books elsewhere from other students, from Amazon.com. Uh, uh, so, so there is a, some uncertainty about exactly how many books the bookstore will sell. So in this particular slide, you can see that the demand and the past experience, they can find some distribution like that. The demand is 10. Uh, at 15% probability, and the demand would be 11 at 22%, demand 12 at 30%, demand would be 13 at uh, 20%, and 14 at 9%, and 15 at 4%. So, 
So this is the nature of demand that the bookstore faces. Now, this, this problem is solved in the supply chain by what is a leader follower game. This leader follower game was put forward by a man named Heinrich Freier von Stuckelberg. He wrote a thesis in 1934 and came up with this idea, which is now known as the Stuckelberg equilibrium. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about what a Stuckelberg equilibrium is. And, and, and before we decide, and before we define the Stuckelberg equilibrium, Stackelberg problem, which will of course require for us to solve this problem. I will then now go into a related concept of what you all know is Nash equilibrium. And so before we, so, so let's discuss the more popular Nash equilibrium by John Nash, which uh, came out in 1950, whom you might know from the movie A Beautiful Mind. Uh, in any game of two or more players, a set of decision is called a Nash equilibrium if no one player can deviate and do better for himself, given that the other people stay with their, their equilibrium decisions. In other words, if one player can do better by changing the decision, knowing the decision of the others, treating them as set in stone, then the set of decision is not an Nash equilibrium. So, so let's now review a, the bar scene in The Beautiful Mind. Incoming gentlemen. Aye, aye. Nash, you might want to stop shuffling your papers for five seconds. I will not buy you gentlemen beer. Oh, we're not here for beer, my friend. Oh. Hmm. Does anyone else feel she should be moving in slow motion? Uh, <laughs> will she want a large wedding, you think? Should we say swords, gentlemen? Pistols at dawn? Have you remembered nothing? Recall the lessons of Adam Smith, the father of modern economics. In, uh, in competition, individual, individual ambition, ambition serves, serves the common good. good. Exactly. Every man for himself, gentlemen. Yeah, and those who strike out are stuck with their friends. Yeah, I'm not going to strike out. You can lead a blonde to water, but you can't make a drink. I don't think he said that. All right, nobody move. She's looking over at Right, she's looking at Nash. Oh, God. All right, he may have the upper hand now, but wait until he opens his mouth. <laughs> 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 remember the last time? Oh, yes, that was one of the history books. <laughs> Adam Smith needs revision. What are you talking about? If we all go for the blonde. We block each other. Not a single one of us is going to get her. So then we go for her friends. But they will all give us the cold shoulder because nobody likes to be second choice. But what if no one goes for the blonde? We don't get in each other's way. And we don't insult the other girls. That's the only way we win. That's the only way we all get laid. <laughs> Adam Smith said, the best result comes <laughs> from everyone in the group doing what's best for himself, right? That's what he said, that's right? Incomplete, incomplete, okay? Because the best result would come <laughs> from everyone in the group doing what's best for himself and the group. Ash, this is some way for you to get the blonde on your own. You can go to hell. Governing <laughs> dynamics, gentlemen. Governing dynamics, Adam Smith. What's wrong? Yep, here we go. Careful, careful. Thank you. <laughs> governing dynamics, gentlemen. Governing dynamics. And Nash goes home, thanks the blind woman for his epiphany, because he goes and go, his, his idea is developing in his head when he says, uh, Adam Smith needs a vision, then he says it's incomplete, and then finally he says it's wrong. And he goes home, writes his 26-page thesis, which is called Non-Cooperative Games, where he develops the concept of Nash uh, The four friends, I suppose, act on Nash's advice, and they all choose the brunette women. And the question is, do their decisions form a Nash equilibrium? Who's for yes? Raise hands. 
Who's for no? One person for no. The person who said no is right. This is not a national equilibrium. Since each friend can gain by going for the blonde woman while others stay with the brunette. See, national equilibrium has nothing to do with how you get there. It's only to do with the dense equilibrium. And that it's defined by what happened if you would deviate. If each person deviate, they would suffer. Okay, this, this is the general idea of equilibrium all over the place. Um, um, generally speaking, I'm not writing anything, but it's defined by two inequalities that says if I deviate, I suffer. If you deviate, you suffer. Okay? So now I'm gonna, gonna go to uh, a simpler example and, and, and define, uh, show what that national equilibrium is in this case. So consider now a simpler version of a scene with two men, Tom and Dick, and two women, Emily and Linda. Both men prefer Emily to Linda, and no one gets any if they choose the same color. Okay? So Tom is in green, and Dick is in orange. These are UTD colors, by the way. <laughs> so, so as we can see here, there are two national equilibria here. Uh, one is Tom takes Emily, Dick takes Linda. This is one equilibrium. And the other one is Tom takes Linda and Dick takes Emily. Uh, the other two are not equally, but this is not equilibrium, okay? So in one, if Tom deviates by going for Linda, he suffers by getting none. Likewise, if Dick deviates by going for Emily, he suffers the same fate. And the same thing can be said uh, for the, the second equilibrium. So this is your Nash equilibrium. So Nash equilibrium in a movie would in fact would be the four of the friends, when one takes the blonde, the other takes the brunette. That would be the equilibrium. How you get there is not clear, right? Also, remember Nash said, he said, the best result comes when everybody is for their own interest. And that's not true. That's incomplete. And he said, the best result comes when everybody it works for their interest and for the group's interest. So you can see that if four people get the brunette, and each brunette is, let's say, payoff of one, the payoff of the group is four. So for the blind, it's two payoff. And if one gets blonde and the other gets three, the payoff of the group is five. So you can see there is a completion of the idea that self-interest and competition are not the only thing. There are things called governing dynamics that changes the picture from Adam Smith to John Nash. Okay? So anyway, we go and continue. Now you go, and my own purpose here is to really get to the Stackelberg equilibrium, because that's what we're going to use for the supply chain, and that's what often, that's usually used in supply chain management of this kind. Okay. So now let's assume, remember that I said Stackelberg equilibrium is a, a leader follower game. So we have to assign at least a leadership role to someone. So let's assume that John is the leader in this case, and Dick is the follower. Okay? Well, you see, the game is sequential. And the sequential game is solved what is called a backward induction. That means first you solve for the best response of the follower when a leader makes a decision. So now, as you can see, there are three responses in this particular case. So when Tom chooses Emily, okay, one response is that, that Dick chooses Linda, and when Tom chooses Linda, that Dick chooses Emily. So that star, or the purple, which it doesn't show very clearly, is one response function. The second response function is down to Emily and Linda. Emily or Linda, Dick always chooses Emily. That's given by the crosses. The third response is Tom chooses Emily and Linda, Emily or Linda, and Dick chooses <coughs> Linda in both cases. So there are three possible response functions, and it's very clear that the purple or the star is the best response. Right? Going further. So now we can see that given Dick's best response function, which is purple, it's clear that Tom's best action is to choose Emily. And from Dick's purple response function, he gets Linda. And that is a Stackelberg equilibrium. The Stackelberg equilibrium in this case is Tom gets Emily and Dick gets Linda. Now, the subtle, we'll go to the next slide. If Tom deviates, he loses. Given the best response for the Dick and purple. Remember, not given the best action of the other guy, it's the best, best response function of the purple. And if Dick changes his response to yellow and blue, which are the other two colors, 
give uh, or the, the crosses and, and the blesses, then the John has chosen Emily. Given that John has chosen Emily, he loses. So the obvious difference between the two equilibria is that the Nash involves simultaneous decision and Stackelberg involves sequential decision. It's also clear that Tom has the first mover advantage being a leader and he gets, he gets Emily. The subtle difference is that in testing whether it's a Nash, it's, whether it's a Stackelberg equilibrium, you remember testing requires a deviation. Everybody who deviates suffers. So if Dick deviates for checking the Nash equilibrium, his deviation to change is Dick's deviation for checking the Nash equilibrium changes action, going from the woman in equilibrium to another. Where his deviation in checking in Stackelberg equilibrium to change his response function from going from purple to either blue or yellow. So that, that, that's the subtle difference between these two equilibria, and, and I hope that's clear now to you. So now we go back to our example. Now that we know what a Stackelberg equilibrium is, we go to our example. In our example, the bookstore is the follower, and uh, the, the publisher, Springer, is the leader. And so for each price that Springer announces, the wholesale price, the bookstore will tell you how much quantity I will order. That's the response function. So the response function is easy to obtain because for each wholesale price, the, the bookstore will maximize its expected profit. Expected because demand is uncertain. And the expected profit equals the revenue from the bookstore, the revenue, which is a smaller revenue from the bookstore, less the purchase cost to the driver that pays. The purchase cost of the order pays. We can easily, and I, I, I got a discrete example, so I don't need calculus for this, this particular lecture. So if the wholesale price is between 99 and 111, the bookstore, the best order would be 12. If the wholesale price is between 114 to 126, the best response for the bookstore is to order 11 books. And if the wholesale price is between 129 and 135, the best is to order 10. I don't go beyond 135 because 135 is the retail price of the book, and any wholesale price beyond the retail price of the book, the bookstore will not order anything. So that's about all the case. And I don't go below 99 because 99 is a cost. So Springer will not sell the, sell the book to the bookstore lower than, less than the 99. <coughs> so that's the response function that we have. Given that response function, the Springer's problem is to maximize his profit. So he knows the response function. And he now has to settle the wholesale price, okay? And in, in, in setting his wholesale price, he has to also consider what is called a store's reservation profit. The reservation profit of the store comes from the idea that store has an alternative opportunity where he can make a certain amount of money. And in this case, let's, let's set that to be $156. This is just for the example. So if you can see that as wholesale price increases, the green line at the Springer property increases. The wholesale price decreases, the orange line, which is the, which is the profit of the bookstore, decreases. It turns out that there is a, there's a, there's a wholesale price of 120, where the, the Springer will set the wholesale price of 120, the store will order 11 books, okay? And the total supply chain profit is $387. Now the benchmark. What happens if they were one company? If there were one company, you can easily find the profit uh, for each number of the books produced. And you can see that when, when you produce 12 books, the profit is $402. $402 versus $387, there's a difference of $15, and that is the profit loss due to double monetization. So we now know what's going on. We have, we have a, 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 a Stackelberg solution where the two, two agents together make profit of $387. Where the whole supply chain, considered as a whole, makes a profit of $402. The question now is, can we squeeze this $15 profit in some way? The idea is not to point a gun at store book, so bookstore's hand and say, order 12. That's not an independent decision making. The idea is to create a contract in which these two guys will make independent decision in some way so that their action will maximize the total supply. That's the idea. So it's kind of a voluntary compliance in the sense that under the contract there will be another set of okay. Let's get to that. So as I mentioned to you, the buyback contract is a contract in which 
the Springer will re it reduces the risk taken by the bookstore, and a bookstore can then order a higher quantity. Well, so there is a buyback price where that quantity will be exactly 12. Okay? So there are, there are, I show you two solutions. One is, if the wholesale break price is 120, the buyback price is 100, and the Springer profit is now 246, and the store's profit is again 156, and the total profit is $402. You can see that in this solution, Springer took all the profit, all the $15 Springer took by setting a particular wholesale price and particular buyback price. But it is possible that the store says, well, you know, you're making $15 extra, you're giving me a buyback contract, I want a part of the pie. Okay, so yes, there's another source. With a wholesale price of $118 and a buyback price of $93, the Springer's profit would be $233, and the store's profit would be $169. In this case, the total supplies and profit still equals benchmark. And so in both these solutions, neither Springer nor the store gets less profit than in the solution without the buyback contract. Also, in the second solution, Springer's profit increases by $2, the store's profit increases by $13. So that's how they split the additional $15 profit in the second, second solution. So each Uh, no, no, no. Yeah. So, so, so the, the, the different combination of wholesale price and a buyback price will give different allocation of that $15 profitability wise. Okay? And, and, and we do not address that issue here because that is the respective bargaining power that they have. If a store has more bargaining power, they can squeeze more of that $15 profit. Like Walmart, for example, has a retailer who says more bargaining power and squeeze profit from, from its suppliers. On the other hand, the supplier is more powerful, then it can squeeze more profit from the retailer. And so that's sort of a, a, a more of a bargain power issue that we do not address. So we are following inside the view game so far. The best centralized order quantity is higher than the equilibrium order quantity by the bookstore. This is because the bookstore does not want to take too much risk. And, and, and risk of getting stuck with all, all textbooks that are unsold. And when they, when they realize demand is low. And this particular uh, idea or this particular uh, thing, uh, issue leads to a loss of efficiency. In the buyback contract, uh, Springer offers a buyback, buyback contract to, to buy the unsold books at the agreed upon price. And, and this reduces the storage risk, allowing the order more than there are a number of possible wholesale price and buyback price combinations that will give you a different allocation of profit, but all of them will achieve the benchmark profit. And moreover, each optimal pair also determines uh, the, 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 the allocation, which then depends on their respective value. Okay, so this is kind of a few concepts that are very important in the supply chain literature. And now I want to uh, talk about uh, a little bit about what possible extensions, and also talk want to talk briefly about my own research in this area. So, uh, of course, uh, customer can be decision makers, and there's a lot of literature called strategic customers. Uh, retail price can be a decision variable as well. So, so the retailer can set a retail price, and then customer can also decide to buy or not buy. So, there are a lot of issues that that can be dealt with. There may be a number of competing supply chains. Notice now, there's no competition. In the, that could be another More generally, a supply chain in reality is a supply network. You may not be able to see it, but it's not really a supply chain. So when we founded the Center of Intelligent Supply Networks, uh, when, when we, we came here, we decided to make it the supply network rather than chain, because in reality, things are more network. All the supply chain is, 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 is used often in the first term. Uh, that was, uh, that was, uh, that was uh, a point. So it, then there is an asymmetric information idea where uh, the, 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 the leader, which now is called principal, doesn't not know much about, or doesn't know everything about the, uh, the follower, which is the agent. And, and this particular theory leads to what is called a theory of mechanism design. And, and, and that's another kind of extension that's possible. My current work is extending this idea that I presented in the example to multi-period. The example is a single period problem. 
And by the way, most of the literature on supply chain coordination, where coordination means getting contracts to get the, the profit, which is equal to the centralized profit. That's, that's the term coordination, okay? So that whole literature, you know, until uh, a few years ago, is all single period. But the word is not single period, word is multiple period. So I'm trying to extend that literature. And so I'm gonna to talk to you about that, what, I, that what I'm doing right now. So for simplicity, we'll consider just two periods. As soon as you go from one to two period, complexities arise. First thing happens is that something happens from period one to two, which combines, couples these two periods. And this is called a state of the system. So in this particular model, for example, when the bookstore doesn't sell all the books in order, those books can be carried over as inventory in the second period. Now the second period decision has to depend on how much inventory you got. And that inventory is a random variable in the first period. Only in the second period you observe it, okay? So, so as you can see, that the decisions now become more complicated. Not only that, there are many possible equilibria that come into the picture. So, so, so there's, there's a whole lot of complexity that comes into it. So I will talk about two possible equilibria. One is called an open loop solution, also called a game with full commitment. Here what happens in two periods, the supplier announces the wholesale price in both periods at the beginning of the game. When supplier does that, the retailer's best response takes both of these prices into account right at the beginning of the game. And in this model, the leader continues to have the first mover advantage. The drawback is that the solution does not take into account the realization of demand or the realization of inventory in the second period, which obviously is not very good, right? The second drawback is that the solution is not time consistent. It's a very important concept because what happens is after you make the first period decision, you can resolve the second period decision. And the, the, if you resolve the second period problem and you don't get the same decision that you announced at the beginning of the period, then it is not time consistent. In other words, the supplier can now renege. He says, hey, well, I gave you the promise, but I, I'm gonna change my mind, right? So the, the, that game only works if there's a full commitment on the part of the supplier that says, okay, I gave you the two wholesale prices, I'm gonna to stick to it. This is what I'm doing. This is called a feedback stackable solution. The feedback stackable solution is somewhat more complicated, but it has some features which are interesting. One is that supplier announces only the first period wholesale price in period one. But he can't just announce the first period because in order to announce the first period, you have to solve the second period also because it's a two-period thing, right? So he announces the first period, although he solves the two-period problem for himself to announce that, okay? In period two, the supplier announces the second period wholesale price after observing the inventory, inventory at the beginning of period two. The retailer responds in each period, period-wise, the announced wholesale prices in that period. So in period, he announces W1, he, he reacts to that and gives the order quantity. Period two, uh, and both take into account the state observed in the second period. Okay? This solution turns out to be time consistent in the sense that after you get the solution, you resolve the problem in the second period, you get the same solution. The drawback is that the leader now does not have a global first mover's advantage. He has an advantage only in each period, which does not always translate to global advantage. I'm not gonna go into more detail of this, but that's kind of general the idea. And I'm not gonna even tell you how to go about solving this right now. And now I want to describe one particular two-period problem that uses this idea of feedback stackable solution. To my mind, this is the first paper that uses this idea in a two-period problem and coordinates the supply chain. And this paper was published last year. Maybe that's why the Kush lecture is from 2018. <laughs> um, uh, last year, uh, and here we get another idea of what is called the production cost learning. So what we are now saying is that if you, period, if you produce more in the first period, there's something called learning by doing, which is a long tradition in Islamic, Islamic, Islamic theory. So, so you, the production cost in the second period declines because you learn and you experience. So more you produce in the first period, the less would be your production cost. You can assume that 
it declines proportionally. Okay? This is the model that we use. So now this is this is this is the this is the setup here. It's a two-pitter setup. And let me just describe the setup. Uh, beginning of period one, they both know the cost of production and the inventory, which is initial inventory. Given that information, the manufacturer, in this case, who is the leader, uh, supplier becomes a manufacturer here, he announces that he decides on a wholesale price and how much he's going to produce. Okay? Then a retailer, knowing these and these, will say, this is the retail price and this is what I'm going to order. It's possible that you will require this Q1 to be less than Q1 because you know what, what, what the and you will, you will order less than, and you will maximize your profit with Q1 less than capital Q. After this takes place, two things happen. First, the learning takes place. The second period cost will be lower. Okay? And that's, by the way, the random variable because we assume stochastic learning. Okay? Uh, the second thing is that the demand realizes. Okay? So you will have some inventory in the second period. So the second period, you'll have an inventory, and you have a cost which will be realized with a small feature. So this, this, that, that will be the problem. After observing this, the manufacturer will set the price value to a QT. And they will, of course, be the function of these quantities. Okay? Uh, once the retailer knows this, the retailer will use his reaction function or response function to set up the, the P2 and P2. Okay? So that's sort of how the game proceeds. And uh, we, we solve the problem using Stackelberg, dynamic Stackelberg game with the feedback Stackelberg solution. And we also, uh, we also uh, supply, we also design a coordinating contract. But let me just go through this. A little bit of a, the manufacturer decisions are W1, Q1. The second period of the decision depend on C2E2, that's sort of more like functions. And the states in the first period are C1, I1, and C2I is in the second period. The retailer's decision is a function of these guys in the first period. And these guys also <coughs> the first period. But when it comes to the second period, the retailer reacts only to the wholesale price, not wholesale price as a function. But this is kind of a subtle difference, but that's what happens. And so the retailer's price depends on these four quantities, and the, and, the, and the retailer's quantity order depends on these four quantities. We solve this problem and we derive following conclusions. First, that the double marginalizers become more severe with learning. And that sort of is intuitive because Remember, the retailer would order lower quantity anyway in a supply chain, which is due to double marginalization, lower than what the optimal quantity for the, the whole supply chain is. But now, with learning, that lower quantity also makes you learn less. So there's another reason why the double marginalization is even more than before. So, so, so there's more reason to find a contract that would coordinate the supply chain. Okay? The second thing we do is we find out why would manufacturer carry inventory. Well, the demand in two periods is different in general. So if the demand in second period is higher, there's a reason to carry inventory. Or also learning. If, you have, if your learning rate is higher, you produce more so that you can carry inventory because it, it, it reduces the cost in the second period. We now did, we design a revenue sharing contract, not a buyback contract. A buyback contract, you offer a price to buy back the unsold quantities. In the revenue sharing, you say, I give you 10% of the revenue, I keep 90% or whatever the portion. So that's, that's what's announced uh, instead of buyback price. It seems that in many cases, both of them are equivalent. As we actually, design a, co a coordinating contract for a two-period supply chain, which actually is done also for the first time. The people involved in the research I would like to acknowledge are my colleagues Omar Ben Susan, Metin Chakundilgrim, Ab, uh, Anyan Chi, and Su Chiang Mai. We are also working on some future work on extending the, the mechanism designed to dynamic settings, which is in terms of in, in, in asymmetric information. The students who are working and have been working with me are Xiaokuan Chen, Tao Li, Achu and Kutani, Ting Yu and Shishan, and they are, some of them are here. And I must say that I couldn't do all of these things because I have a very, very good assistant. <laughs> That's a Lindsay Wilson. And, and I, this is the first time that she's doing PowerPoint. All my PowerPoint presentations are done by the students. 
everywhere I present, the students are co-authors. This is one time I don't have a co-author, so, so Lizzie, thank you for, for doing this. Well, my work in this area is published in several places, and this is a list, but I'm not going to bore you with reading this, but it's available on my website or homepage or whatever, uh, so, so for those who are interested, can, can, can look at that. And I am open to questions. Yes. One of the things that we like is preferred suppliers, and does that fit in in any way where a company, you know, instead of looking at a place to get preferred suppliers, so they would sort of necessarily have some agreements maybe and stuff? Yeah, yeah, you can, but this is a work that uh, Elena Kato is doing here uh, in terms of supplier certification and things like that. But I am not working on that problem. I, I stay with mostly theoretical work. That's my, my <laughs> cup of tea or my forte. <coughs> yes? Well, there are, there are, there's work. Taking into co combining yes, the, the yes, yes. And yes, yes. In fact, uh, one of the Chinese leaders in Libro and I are working on a problem which is combine the financial aspect and the operations. In this case, for example, a supplier doesn't have enough money, so must go to a bank to take a loan. And the retailer may not have enough money, so the retailer, but the retailer's credit rating is not so good. So the retailer actually get a credit from the supplier. So they get a trade credit. So that's part of this uh, uh, cycle game in this case. So yes, they're working. And I also do it in marketing. Some of those papers that you saw in marketing, where you have what's called cooperative advertising, where I as, I am, I as, a, I as, a, as a manufacturer says, I will support your advertising to a certain percent, because otherwise you don't advertise enough for my good. So that's another way you can, you can do it. So, the, so the, the, the concept of supply chain is rather general. And the, the and the and the, the, the dynamic Stackelberg setting obviously is, is quite 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 useful in this. And uh, I, I must say that the Alanda Society is I think one of the major co-authors here. We just published a theoretical piece in Science Journal of Control on on, on the, the, the global Stackelberg solutions, which are more than just the two uh, two equilibria that I mentioned. There, there are several more equilibria that I didn't. Does uh, this work, uh, assuming a free enterprise system, does it have any applications to a planned economy system? Uh, well, uh, you, you could consider government as a leader, uh, which sets up a, a fiscal policy, and then other people would use uh, uh, you know, their decision. By the way, uh, just I was reading that Los Angeles Airport uses the Stackelberg equilibrium for, for searches. So the security people announces a, a search scheme. Uh, and, and then the people uh, can, can, can make their decisions in that way. Security people are the leader in this case. And there, it turns out, the game is somewhat more complicated. I didn't mention it was called a mixed equilibrium. It's a mixed equilibrium is where you don't make a pure decision like choosing Emily or Linda, but you flip a coin. And then if the coin comes head, you go there. And the coin has to have a certain bias depending on the, the equilibrium that you choose, right? Yeah. Okay, Hassan will have a Hassan will have a head coin and the head will come all the time. Uh, so so there the security actually gives you a mixed strategy saying we will search 
with this probability and not, and, and whatever, whatever the scheme is. I haven't gotten into it, but people have used the idea of Stapleberg concept. <coughs> So if you maximize the social welfare, then you're having centralized supply chain. Yeah. So then it's not a decentralized solution. But you can still. <coughs> yes? Oh yeah, well, a multiple model, the, the idea is the same, in the sense that. Will it be increasing or shrinking? No, this is depends on the problem. I mean, the, it, it's, 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 it, the concept is basically that centralized solution gives you a better profit, uh, and, and, and there's a loss. And this loss can depend on parameters and, and many other things. But a centralized solution gives you better profit. Why not? Well, uh, people like to make independent decisions, okay? So that's the... Well, what I'm saying, though, Suresh, is that that's, there's got to be something preventing us from vertical integration. Otherwise, we would vertically integrate, and we will make the books, and we will sell the books, and so on and so forth. Well... And, and clearly, that's not the case. There is specialization, and vertical integration doesn't take place. So there has to be a force. Let, let's look at a uh, case of Coke and Pepsi. Coke and Pepsi are two companies, and people have modeled Coke and Pepsi as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a Stackelberg solution, where Coke was the leader, and the Pepsi was a follower, and then the Pepsi was the leader, and the Coke was a follower, and then the question is, would you consider Coke and Pepsi to combine? There are, there are obviously mergers, but that government prevents that merger. What you're, what you're asking for is a merger of two companies. And then there are antitrust laws, because when you have a merger, you reduce the competition. No, those, we, this are, those are competing companies selling similar products. I'm talking about a pure supplier and a retailer. So you know, vertical integration would then imply that the, the bookstore actually would belong to Springer, right? Because they become central and they make the decision to maximize. There, there are, there, okay, first is uh, wherever you can find a situation where vertical integration is, is, is beneficial, this happens. But there's also another issue that the people have local knowledge and they, 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 they a company can become too big for its own good or it may not be specialized enough to, to deal with local people uh, and that would cause other kind of inefficiencies which, which will prevent that. Yes. Right. And, and, and people want to be empires to themselves. They want to be variations on, on that theme. And you can't control them by a simple formula. We like to think we can, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is also a, a point that the supplier will have several customers and the retailer. So we have here, we are speaking of. Only two people, of course, only two people, maybe capital integration, but in practice, they are specialized. So the integration is still the benchmark. And it would be difficult to have Springer to include all the bookstores at every university. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, it's not like, and there are other publishers as well, so they will be fighting as well. Small type products. So there are, there are, there are there, there, I think the question that you ask is a much larger question than this. Yeah. Well, uh, I think he does deserve a Nobel Prize because the idea was uh, before Nash, uh, Don von Neumann and Morgenstern wrote that famous tome which only looked at what is called the non zero sum games. And zero sum game was so limited because, because my profit is your loss and your loss is my profit. 
and it was a very simplified version of the game. So Nash came up with this idea that 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 everybody can have everybody can have their own objective that they want to maximize. Of course, all of this come all the way back to Cournot. Cournot was in 1800s, and he 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 did uh, he did uh, two companies that were that were that were producing certain output, and and it, it, you can either have the output announced simultaneously, which is Nash, or one, and then you can have a stackable where one guy announces output before the other, then he would produce more than the other. So Cournot was uh, prior to these, and then Stackelberg wrote his piece in 1934, and Nash actually. Is, uh, is 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 uh, is 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 anyone? It, I I believe he didn't even cite second place, as far as I know. Uh, he cites only two books. Two, two, the Nash's thesis only has two references. One is von Norman Morgenstern, and the other one is his own paper in 1950. That's it. There are only two references in the 20th century. Nash is genius, not only in economics, but also in economics. Yeah, yeah. The Nash was around because Cournot already had the idea. So it's not like it was a that big an idea, but the movie makes him famous. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very well, much for a stimulating lecture. And I guess I'll say Thank you all for coming and <laughs>